Bootstrap session. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on which time zone you're in. The format is currently on your screen. We will be having four discussions this morning or this afternoon. Each discussion will last, each presentation will last 10 minutes, have a one minute pause. And then we will have a 10 minute coffee and or bathroom break after which discussion of all presentations will take place. Our first presenter is Damien Dooley of the University of British Columbia. The title of the presentation is Food on Evolution in the Food Ontology Ecosystem. Damien is an ontology in the Ipsacio Public Health Bioinformatics Labs in Vancouver, British Columbia. After an ancient cognitive science degree and two decades of leading internet startups app developments, Damien became an ontology love affair six years ago while working on a Canadian IRIDA passenger bioinformatics web platform. He is active in OBO Foundry and Ontology for Biomedical Investigation Operation and leads the Genomic Epidemiology and Food on Ontologies. Damien, would you take, uh, share your screen and start your presentation? Sure, great. <clears throat> Oh, wrong one. Just a sec. Uh, and one other thing, while I'm presenting, um, if audio is a problem, let me know. And uh, so already I'm needing to find the share button. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, yes, so thanks for the introduction, Robert. So I work out of the Shao Public Health Bioinformatics Lab in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the I have a few people to thank for supporting us. The SFU, Simon Fraser University, U.S. Department of Agriculture, University of British Columbia, and Genome Canada, as well as our lab mates who are helping with curation of um, food on and recent contributors. I'm here to talk about food on and the evolution of this ontology in the last few years, especially within this food ontology ecosystem that's uh, coming up in the, um, in the Oval Foundry family of ontologies. So I'll talk about how food on began, the kind of vocabulary that we started needing in public health and the Obo Foundry curation community that's uh, supporting that. And I'll touch on a food product example and some tools and agency projects that Food Audit is involved in. So at the, uh, at the lab, Shao Lab, we're involved in public health. As more specifically, we started out in infectious disease, foodborne pathogens and sequencing. And in that whole, realm. Uh, the activity is investigating outbreaks. In this 2011 E. coli uh, one was quite predominant in that way. It started in Germany. May 1st, uh, there was a real difficulty trying to figure out where this um, pathogen was, uh, was located in the food system. Uh, so it took actually a few uh, over three weeks, a few, up to a month, I think, and the whole epidemic lasted for two months to uh, locate the food sources. 4,000 people were ill, 47 fatalities. It ended up being pinpointed to Egyptian fenugreek seeds, possibly one single shipment. So obviously the fast and accurate detection of pathogens is critical, but the data problem around the language between the different agencies that are use uh, needing to trade information to do the trace forward and trace back is a real problem. This is exemplified by the interview forms that uh, different public health agencies have. Uh, here we're looking at the CDC Atlanta interview forms that look at uh, people who've come in contact with risky food, with a uh, foodborne outbreak. Uh, what kind of disease, hospitalization, date and time, all the who, what, where, whens of an investigation, and this food 
snacks, uh, food descriptions. What did you eat? Was it preserved, unrefrigerated? And, uh, are samples available? So all of this food vocabulary is, um, uh, is needed across agencies and the interview sheets are really very similar between the BCCDC, the WHO, and other agencies. So that's just to frame the problem. What we wanted to do was look at uh, any existing vocabulary that could be brought into the ontology world to support this. Uh, and we ended up deciding on Languel, which um, was a vocabulary that actually stretches all the way back to 1975. It's a food description vocabulary that allows uh, food database indexers to describe plates of food or what's on them, dishes, <clears throat> and uh, in, in order to uh, pair up with, uh, with nutritional information. So we took Languel, brought it in, and it's 14 facets to describe food, brought it into um, an ontology, uh, food on. And we also, at the same time, wanted to reuse ontology vocabulary for taxonomy, anatomy, and other descriptors, chemistry. And so we turned to Obofoundry, the family of um, ontologies, for that. And each of these ontologies is attempted to be um, orthogonal in terms of vocabulary, reusing each other's terms. It's called the Muriel principle. And that's important in order to not reinvent the wheel when we're uh, using this. So what that ends up being for food on is that you can take a look at a food product and look at each of the facets to describe it. And with those facets, um, find that some terms are from food on itself for the product name, but others are um, already created by other uh, ontologies. So NCPI taxon is for the plant or animal food source. The, on, the anatomy part, leg, stem, leaf, seed, is covered by plant uh, anatomy, plant ontology and the Uberon anatomy. The relations ontology and it takes care of uh, food processes like preserved, cooked, um, and Pado takes care of other facets like color of food, um, texture. This enables us to have a bag of terms to describe a product like organic mashed potatoes, uh, sorry, organic mashed carrot baby food jarred, and name off that uh, a jar is part of this project product, organic label is involved, the product name is carrot, stringed, baby food, and the uh, plant is carrot plant, and so on. But ontologies go a step further. It's not just a bag of terms that we get out of this. We can actually create a model for the food product. So we can point to a consumer of the food or a set of consumers the kinds of quality of that food, what uh, plant and animal taxonomy that derives from the parts possibly and the processes involved in creating it. So that fulfilled our mission for the epidemiology side in terms of investigations of foodborne outbreaks. And we launched Food On about three years ago. Since then, a bunch of other ontologies have popped up, and that's what this whole workshop is about. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about the other ontologies, the number of which uh, use food on product names or plant and animal source, and, um, and talk about the nutritional components, more of a research focus, the FOBI food biomarker ontology, FIDEO food interactions with drugs, crop, dietary, nutrition, ontology, and so on. So they're all using the Ovo Foundry family of ontologies, the base layer for taxonomy, chemistry, anatomy, environment, uh, along with food on. So in this work, we've just been looking at basic food patterns 
And um, this is sort of the interface from the harvested world into uh, productizing food. And that means um, being able to look at a sample of a food anywhere along the product chain and identify what organism it came from and what part of uh, the plant or animal. This is a bit more focused on post-harvest when you haven't done any more subsequent processing. At least, at the very least, we can say a sample comes from this food if it's a single ingredient. So here's an example. An apple hole is a palm fruit. That's the anatomical part, and it derives from Malus domestica. We can further specialize that into a Fuji apple from a Fuji apple tree. So the other thing that happens then is you move on from just having a whole apple. Um, you get to start talking about other states of that apple. Here it's raw. Here it's sliced. And there are processes involved. So this brings us to food on development. What are we doing? We are um, at 28,500 terms, and there's a breakdown here uh, of them all. I can say that um, on the chemical food component, we are bringing in USDA and in foods and nutrients, complements of all the work that the Crop Dietary Nutrition Ontology is doing uh, just now. We're going to consolidate some organisms. There's some repetition there between the NCBI taxonomy organisms and the ones that Foodon mentions. We are creating that pattern we just saw on the last slide for organism times part to create um, entities for that. One minute. And uh, bringing Wikipedia definitions and enhanced in the process branch mapping agency foods. And that is a list of agency projects that, that we're involved in now. So just to wrap up, um, there are some tools and visualization tools that we're going to be uh, making available for food on. So thanks. And I'll stop sharing now. All right. Our next presentation is titled The Crop Dietary Nutrition Ontology, Aligning the Domains for Production and Consumption, presented by Liliana Andres from, uh, excuse me, from Southern Cross University in Australia. Liliana Andres is a PhD candidate under the supervision of Professor Graham King she has a BA in biology and an MA in plant biology from the National Library of Genomics for Biodiversity, Mexico, and previously worked as a bioinformatician in the private sector. For her PhD project, knowledge representation and database integration to facilitate analysis and de development of underutilized crop plants, Lillian has immersed herself in the world of standardization and, ha and harmonization of data to bridge the domains of crop science and nutrition. Earlier this year, she published a review paper in crop science, has co-authored another, and has a paper under review focused on fair compliance of crop, of trail data. Lillian, would you take over? Yep. Uh, so just to be sure, you can see the first slide, right? We can see it perfectly. Okay, that's good. Um, hi, my name is Liliana Andres, and today I will be presenting my PhD uh, project. My supervisors are Professor Graham King and Dr. Ramil uh, Mavlion. The title of my talk is The Crop Dietary Nutrition Ontology, Aligning the Domains of uh, Production and Consumption. And uh, I would like to start mentioning that uh, meeting the challenge of um, nutritional security requires ongoing innovation particularly in managing um, dietary nutritional information for pre-breeding analysis, selection, and cultivation of specific <coughs> food crops and uh, crop plant varieties or cultivars. Um, at present, uh, the ability to compare nutritional value from different crops is limited with uh, 
data management systems for most crops often inconsistent and poorly integrated, as well as limited data uh, standardization and interoperability. So if a dietitian wants to compare um, two cultivars to know which cultivar contains more protein, or if a plant breeder is interested in knowing the nutritional value of specific cultivars, they may face some um, issues accessing, uh, reusing, or um, navigate, uh, navigating nutritional information across different servers, uh, database, databases, or spreadsheets. So um, this issue exists because the dietary nutritional data have been uh, deposited in different databases, uh, spreadsheets, and publications, uh, including also supplementary data. So that is often inconsistent and, inconsistent and poorly integrated. Uh, some of these resources uh, or sources involve the Food Data Central, uh, the inputs uh, from FAO, which um, not include a variation within the species. Um, and they are not um, cultivar specific and uh, they, the key uh, micronutrients are often underreported. So, actually um, innovative strategies for the management of dietary nutritional information in crop plants um, are required. So um, we could say no problem, let's use an existing ontology to associate and access the existing nutritional information. However, uh, we found that just few ontologies provide a comprehensive nutritional representation of uh, comprehensive representation of dietary nutritional information and most of them do not appear um, eff efficiently managed, updated, or um, easily accessible. Um, also, some other ontologies lack of specificity in the tailored uh, subclassification of terms um, within classes or on the opposite, um, they also present an exhaustive level of granularity such as Kevin. Uh, which contains around 140,000 terms associated with molecular entities and um, biosynthesis, which is actually great. Uh, we actually want um, that exhaustive uh, level of granularity, but there is um, actually more information on that, what is required for dietitians and breeders. So although KB um, contains an exhaustive level of granularity across the classification of the chemical compounds, um, as we can see, for example, in this image, um, the, the, it represents um, a starting point um, to map or reuse semantically equivalent chemical or nutritional compounds to represent um, the existing dietary nutrition uh, information. So for this reason, we have proposed the development of the crop dietary nutritional ontology or CDNO. So the CDNO has been um, initially designed uh, with three major classes, which is the dietary nutritional component, dietary function, and analytical method. Um, with these specific classes, it is expected um, to generate a formal um, human and machine readable control vocabulary to navigate um, crop related nutritional information. So today I'm just gonna talk about the dietary nutritional component class, um, which uh, will be developed by reusing different um, data sources and databases, for example, inputs, food data central, um, different um, literature as well. But um, one of the most important is um, in developing the, the, the CDNO will be the crop uh, dietary nutritional, nutrition data uh, framework. So um, what is this uh, framework? So the CDNDF uh, is a branch tree uh, hierarchy created by Asman Halimi in 2019. So this framework has been um, updated in version two with uh, terms from Food Data Central uh, mainly at the moment. 
containing now 400, 478 dietary nutritional components. And so this um, hierarchy has been considered for the main design of the CDNO, reducing the classification uh, of dietary nutritional components. Um, also, it is important to mention that the CDNDF um, is the only source with semantic equivalent associations to KEBI. So that's actually really helpful for us in the development of the CDNO. Um, so also because the CDNO is representing knowledge from crop to diet, it requires not only the reuse of chemical entities from KEBI, but the reuse of other existing ontology terms uh, for this reason, we are providing concepts uh, that can be adopted by Foodon, representing um, knowledge related to uh, harvested products. So for example, we can say um, that uh, cereal grain um, being uh, harvested from wheat or a soy grain um, harvest from a soybean. So at the moment, uh, 58 terminologies uh, related to crops with their harvested products um, are being integrated by the food, uh, food on team. And um, so following uh, an axiom provided by the PhD student, Kai Blomberg, member of the EMBO team, the CDNO axiom looks mostly like this. Um, so where the concentration of terminology um, it's taken from uh, the beta ontology. And in here is in some KB or KB glucose that is um, taken uh, from the KB ontology. In the, uh, in the seed, and seed is taken by, from the plant ontology, derived from uh, Bambara groundnut. And this specific um, term will be also associated to the NCBI taxon or an NCBI, NCBI taxon ID. So um, in this way, we will have all the terminologies um, cross-reference. So the development of the CDNO is still in progress, but we are uh, expecting to release the OWL file at the end of December. So the CDNO will then be associated to real data initially uh, in CropStoreDB a database that contains information related to phenotypic quality rates and nutritional information. Uh, but this will be for the reuse as well of plant breeders, researchers, nutritionists, and dietitians. So I just would like to thank my supervisors and collaborators for, um, for, their, uh, for their inputs and also the time invested in this project and to all of you for your time and maybe questions or interest. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. We will not be taking questions at this time, mm -hmm. but we will do so in the afternoon after all the presentations. Our next talk is titled The Plant Trade Ontology Links Wheat Traits for Crop Improvements and Genomics by Laurel Cooper. Laurel is the project coordinator and scientific curator with the Plant Genome Project, formerly the Plant Ontology Project, working primarily on developing reference ontologies for plant science and comparative bioinformatic analyses. Laurel joined the Grain Genes Database team in August 2019 as a halftime curator, bringing considerable experience in the many facets of curation and is working closely with the Grain Genes team to curate the weight gene catalog into the Grain Gene database. Today, Laurel will show us how the plant trade ontology from the Planting Project facilitates data integration by linking plant genomics data at the plant team with traits data at Grain Gene and the specific grain crop ontology. Laura? Great, thank you very much. And good morning, everyone from Smoky, Oregon. <laughs> can you see my first slide? Yes, we can. 
Okay, yeah. great, great. So um, I'm not going to repeat the title because we've already seen that. So the goals of the Plantium project, um, I thought it'd be helpful to restate these. The, the Plantium, we aim to develop and maintain a network of re reference ontologies for plants, which link plant traits, phenotypes, gene expression, genomes, genetic diversity data from a very wide range of plant species. And today I'm going to be mostly focusing on weed, but I want to highlight the fact that we do cover about 125 different plant species. And our goal is to align our reference ontologies with descriptors from species specific vocabularies, which are useful for the breeding community. And this way we can link the genomics data with the breeding data. And our goal is to create mappings which are links to other ontologies and databases. So um, we just did a, we're just in the process of doing a new release for the Plantium, release version 4.0. And um, in this release, we have four basic, well, three basic reference ontologies developed by the Plantium for the plant ontology, which has already been mentioned here, um, the tr plant trade ontology, the TO, for the plant experimental conditions ontology, which is useful for describing um, experimental data. And we also host 11 species specific crop ontologies developed by the Crop Ontology Project uh, um, with Elizabeth Arno. And they're listed here, cassava, lentil, maize, pigeon pea, potato, rice, sorghum, soybean, sweet potato, wheat, and yam. And so these are bringing in um, breeder traits and breeder variables that they're interested in using in their breeding programs. And we host a large amount of annotation data. <clears throat> we have about almost 20 million ontology-based annotations to about 3.1 million data objects, which are mostly genes and gene products, germplasm sources, and some QTLs and mutant data. So as I mentioned, this covers more than, I think about 124, 125 taxa, and we're pulling that data in from about 30 database sources. And the Plantium ontologies are used by approximately more than 40 major plant biology resources worldwide. So it's been widely adopted. Um, this diagram shows a diagram or is a diagram of the suite of reference ontologies hosted at the Plantium. And you can see the yellow ones are ontologies um, developed in-house by the Plantium project. The blue ones are partner ontologies, uh, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, the Go and um, Heavy, which Aunt Liliana mentioned. And it um, this also sort of shows you the scope of the reference ontologies. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so it runs from a very broad granularity with the experimental conditions and ENVO down to a single molecule. So the plant trade ontology consists of nine upper level categories, which um, encompasses a wide variety of traits that, that you'll find in plants. Everything from biochemical traits, biological processes, morphology, sterility or, or fertility, yield, which of course is very important in crops, plant qualities, and, and also abiotic and biotic stresses. So the plant ontology has, or the plant trade ontology has about 1600 terms <clears throat> with links to about 165,000 data objects in Plantium. So one of the things that the plant trade ontology does is it links um, common types of data from various species because in the plant world you can see that these are, this is, these are all six of these are examples of fruit color traits across various species and they all have different terminologies and different um, names that are in use in the literature and so on so by by annotating these all with our to term or fruit color trait, we can gather that information and make comparisons across, across different species and um, investigate all these different kinds of data types. So these annotations are very important. So in addition to the reference ontologies, as I mentioned, we have 11, 11 species specific ontologies developed by the crop ontology from the CGIAR centers around the world. And this is just an example of three of them. The wheat ontology was developed at CIMIT and there's been recently some input from the T3 project on the wheat ontology, which was really helpful. And with my role, new role at Grammy or Grain Genes, I've been adding more terms to <clears throat> 
more terms to the ontology to describe traits that we're using in QTLs and so on. And so this is the wheat, wheat at Simit, lentils were developed down at Carta, at Carta, and the rice ontology from Erie. And you can see each of them, there's a few examples and some numbers of um, the data. So the question is with these species specific ontologies, how can we make these interspecific comparisons across these ontologies? and make this data accessible to everyone from breeders to scientists working on comparative genomics projects. So the way this is done is we um, map these, these CO terms to the trait ontology terms using the design patterns which are integrated into the ontologies. And so this slide shows an example of a uh, mapping between two terms, one from the CO, one from the wheat CO, and one from the TO, where <clears throat> when on first glance, especially if you were a computer, wouldn't realize that the wheat spike is an inflorescence and that the wheat spike length is the same as an inflorescence length, a more specific category of it. But the reasoner can use the design patterns and um, within this term, within the CO term, the design pattern is the PO term for inflorescence spike and then the pedo term for length and the the reasoner can identify that these are the same and and map these so a lot of this work was done by marie angelique laporte with the crop ontology and she's now with the Seat biodiversity international alliance and so this this slide shows an example of um three of or four of the crop ontologies with their plant height term mapped to the TO plant height. And so you can see in our hierarchy, if data is annotated to these more specific terms, that data can be aggregated under the TO term and it's useful for making cross, cross species comparisons and comparative genomics inquiries. And this just gives a little example. This hierarchy here is the TO hierarchy, and it shows how it interacts with PADO and with the PO through the relationships of ISA and part of and so on. So, yeah. So um, also with um, the new integration with grain genes, this is very exciting because grain genes is an integrated relational database and internet resource for the international small greens community and provides a large amount of curated genomic and genetic information about Tritaceae species. And I took a little screenshot there so you can see the front page and we welcome people to come and visit the, the database. Um, Green Genes hosts a diversity of data types including genome browsers, comparative linkage maps, sequence polymorphisms and QTLs. So you can see that the data at Green Genes is different than a lot of what we cover at Plantiome. So it's very complementary. And I just put a um, citation down here for Victoria Blake, who's one of the main curators. She has a recent paper on the Green Genes database in database last year. So one of the example, I want to show you an example of um, how we're annotating trait data at Green Genes and integrating it with Plantium and with the CO terms. So currently Green Genes has about 386 traits that are described. About 246 of those are currently mapped to TO terms and about 72 are also mapped to CO terms. And these links back to the uh, Plantium database so that you can um, visualize the data there and go and look and see what we have in comparison. So here's another example. This is a reaction to stem rust term. And you can see um, this is mapped to the Plantium fungal disease resistance term, oops, and also to the CO uh, wheat stem rust response trait. So we have a number of tools that are available for collaboration. All of our ontologies, including the crop specific ontologies, are available on our GitHub. And we welcome you to come and um, request terms or make suggestions. So um, we, we encourage community feedback and try to address it as quickly as we can. <laughs> so um, we encourage how you can get involved, explore the annotations and ontologies. Um, if you don't have a GitHub account, we encourage people to get a GitHub account and come and visit us. 
annotate your data and work with us to submit your reposit your data to our repository. And here's a recent publication from NAR last year on the one minute. Okay, I'm just wrapping up. Yep. So I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of partners who were, have been involved in this. The Plantium is a quite a large multinational project with folks around the world. The main PI is Pankaj Jaiswal at Oregon State University and I work in his lab. We have a number of other um, collaborators at Lawrence Berkeley, New York Botanic Garden, um, University of Buffalo, um, UK, and we also work very closely with Elizabeth Arno and her team at Bioversity, and especially Marie Angelique Laporte. Um, and some of the folks from CIMIT, such as Rosemary, were involved with developing the, the, the wheat trait dictionary. And at Green Genes, the lead PI at Green Genes is Tanner Sen, and the lead, the other lead curator that works really closely is with me is Vic Carella Blake. So, and I just want to acknowledge the funding from NSF. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing now. Apologies, this is annoying. <laughs> Our next presentation is the Agronomy Ontology, a semantic layer to standardize agronomic data in farming system research and development by Céline Aubert. Céline Aubert is an agronomist working with the CGIAR for the past seven years. She is the project coordinators of Agro FIMS, a tool to create agronomic field books and one of the two developers and curators of the agronomy ontology. Céline, we can see your, your, your slides. Perfect. Thank you, Robert, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. So I will talk about the agronomy ontology. And first, let me give you some background of the context in which we developed this ontology. So the agronomy ontology has been built within the platform for big data and agriculture. It's one of the multi-center project of the CGAR. And this all started with questions from raising from researcher on how to improve agriculture in regions where they were working. To help the researcher answer these questions, Guardian has been built, and Guardian is a tool to discover agricultural data and publications across CGAR centers and other uh, institutions, like the one you can see. And so researcher um, could find, explore, and even analyze the stats, and eventually share all the stats. But when we started to look in detail at the data sets uh, we could find in Guardians, we realized there were some discrepancies. So I will show you one of the data sets we were able to find in Guardians. So if you look in detail to this one, you can wonder what, what are these two empty columns, what this code is mean, and if you scroll at the end, this 8,000 uh, large data set, language even is changing. So even the researcher could find the data, they could not really use it. And the question became how to use the data without spending months trying to understand it. So but basically how to get and how to make data fair. So to solve this issue, we started to create a set of tools within the big data form is Guardian as a centerpiece. Then we built Rufems. It's a web application that helps agronomists to create fields that integrate semantics. So people can go in the field, collect data, and this data already annotating, annotated using ontologies. But to make uh, this all working, we uh, needed uh, to integrate ontology within those tools. So um, when we started uh, to develop the agronomy ontology, 
there were already a lot of ontologies covering agronomic germs, like the soils uh, from ENVO or the chemicals from K, but they were big in terms on how to describe the germs. And those information is critical to reuse the data because if you don't know how uh, the uh, experiment has been laid out in the, in the field, how the crop has been grown, you may misinterpret part of the data. So that's why we created the agronomy ontology to provide the semantics needed to describe agricultural trial from the experimental condition to the agronomic practices and also uh, including implements and put and crop measurements. So of course, we did not uh, want it to reinvent the wheel. So uh, we started to look at what was already existing and uh, we gathered terms uh, that exist in other ontologies. Um, so here you can see the list of ontology we are importing terms from. So for example, we are using terms from ENVO, like the soil or uh, everything related to the environment of the experiment. The experiment. So you can be described as fertilizer. Uh, from ENVO, we import food products that are also used as a fertilizer. We also use uh, pato terms to create variables like the length, the weight, and to describe the plant, we use uh, plant ontology, trait ontology that Laurel just described, and also the crop ontology. So after gathering external terms, we focus on our efforts on describing terms that are specific to the agronomy ontology and that they were not existing in those ontologies. So the entry point of agro is the agricultural experimental plot. So this plot can be either an entire field or just a part of this field. But basically, it's where the experiment, uh, experiment uh, is taking place. And this class plot is linked to different concepts like the variable that can be measured on that plot. So here we have the plot length, the plot width, the plot area. And then on this plot, activities uh, will happen. So here, for example, we have a planting process. So um, basically it's what the farmer or the, the researcher is doing on this field. And for that kind of activities, we have built a second type of class that are called processes. And so, well, like this uh, planting process. And so basically a, a process is everything that is time bound and as a in date. And for each process, you will find a list of what we call participants. And um, participant can be a, a tool or it can be also inputs, materials that you will uh, add to the field, like, like fertilizer, pesticides. And it's also linked to different techniques to perform this process. So using this uh, process class, you can describe everything that is happening uh, in your field over time. So now I will deep dive into the ontology using a simplify view. So for example, here we have an agricultural experiment following a design. Here it's a completely randomized design. And this acronymic experiment is occurring in an experimental plot that I just uh, mentioned before. And then the management, some management practices happen. So the process, basically the processes here, it's an agronomic fertilization process. And this process as participants, here is the, the implement or the tool, it's a broadcast, broadcast spreader. And also this process is applying some uh, inputs. Here it's limestone. And you can see that this term is not from the agronomy ontology, it's coming from ENVO. 
And what is important to know about uh, the process, what, what is important to know in this process is how much limestone uh, we need to add to and so for that, um, we need to create organic fertilizer amount. And to create this term, we need to uh, import the term uh, pato amount. And we also need, it, need to link it to the kilogram per hectare term from the unit ontology. And so this is how we link agronomic specific terms to external uh, term. So here is a quick overview of the terms that you can find in the Inagro. So you will find term about the agronomic, uh, sorry, experiment. You also find term about the processes like the irrigation, the fertilization, the harvest. You have a list of the tools that you can find and also a list of implements so, uh, of inputs. So here, the fertilizer. We have around uh, 1,600 terms in the ontology. So I invite you to browse the ontology, either on OLS or on the Agronomy Ontology webpage to have a better idea of all the, the content. So in terms of maintenance, we follow the OPPO foundry principles. The ontology is open and reuse and we are reusing terms from relevant ontologies to avoid overlapping and it's actually in addition yes to the ontology development kits to import terms from external ontology and to make reels and the ontology is published in github where you can find the issue tracker and ask for a new term we always uh, welcome feedback and uh, we are happy to take uh, yes new new suggestions. And so finally, I would like to thank all the people that have contributed to Agro, and it was extremely valuable. And thank you for your attention. And I, I hope now you have a better idea of what you can find in the agronomy ontology and how it's linked to the other ontologies. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. We now have a break. We will be reconvening at 1410 UTC in about 10 minutes. Please stretch your limb, get a cup of coffee, have a bathroom break, and bring your questions, comments, and conversations. Thank you. Uh, the at the moment it's uh we're on a break uh oh, for about, oh, yeah okay 
Uh, okay, then uh, then fine. You can pause the recording if you want, or just edit. it. Through. All right. People want to ask. It's also listed in the chat. Uh, if you agree, I'm just going to open up with a direct question to Damien. So one of the questions that I have is, within Foodon, you have a crop. You have prepared products, which is, let's, for example, say an omelet. And then you'll have a product, which is perhaps pancakes mix that you'll buy from the store. Uh, are there any corner cases where those there's a collision between these three different things? And there, there are fundamental incompatibilities that you haven't been able to address. Uh, I certainly run into semantic problems trying to define some stuff, um, although, and mull over things. Uh, but uh, cases don't come to mind in that regard at the moment. Um, what I can say is the food products, um, there, there's been a little bit of a change in the modeling. Um, we have a, uh, a single component, basically, uh, organism food product branch, which is supposed to just have the um, uh, foods that are almost not at all processed or are minimally processed, but just contain one, one food item. The, 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 the problematic area is um, that we also want to have a multi-component food area that has more than one ingredient. And that's kind of easier when you've got um, like lasagna that clearly has different ingredients. But if you have a can of uh, beans, um, does it, is it a multi-component food? Well, it has salt in it um, and it has water added to it. So is that enough to make it a multi-component food? So we're kind of lost in a little bit there, but being uh, migrating a number of foods over to the multi-component area and perhaps not something that has water added or salt, but um, Vinegar. Um, so that's that's the that's the area actually I I'm all over. So you can see when you go to the um, organismal food source of uh, food on, you're going to see some products still that haven't been moved over to multi-component area. Okay, this discussion is supposed to be free form. I can read questions from the document, or you can add them, or you can jump in and ask your own questions. Please don't be shy. We're relatively reasonably sized groups, so we should not have too many co collision over the talk. Right. I was going to add one other thing. Um, we're going to start up a food on curation group. And so this, at the moment, uh, term requests have been coming in to us from GitHub and from um, partner projects. But uh, we will be adding, we'll be starting a, some, probably a bi weekly curation group and providing training uh, so that these decisions aren't just uh, happening within, within the Shell lab. So, moving along, uh, Debian, I have a question from GBM here. What do you think about using machine learning as a tool to expand logics? Yeah, so I'm really uh, I'm interested in the possibility that machine learning can be used, first of all, to suggest membership in ontological classes of entities, and there, thereby filling out classes of, of terms. The machine learning world is sort of the world of real world probabilistic data, whereas ontologies are world of formal logic and reasoners that um, either are satisfiable or not. So when ontologists try to add a new uh, category to a parent category, they're using the um, Aristotelian definition of a, a blank is a blank, which is, which has a blankety blankety blank. And that expression uh, needs to show up in our logic very discreetly. 
And I think it's sort of a bridge that humans can sort of understand that logic. So machine learning needs to deliver at least a suggestion platform for expressing class membership that way. But I think there are lots of other opportunities for machine learning. And there are other folks on the call here who are doing work in that. Um, if Taruni happens to be listening, uh, she could have some things to say. Um, yeah, actually, um, some of the very early work um, was to create knowledge bases. Um, and this is used a lot in um, to answer web queries. Um, so there's a lot of um, relationships that end over time and that keep growing. And these have relation. These are relations like you know who was the president of which country and um, stuff like that. The kind of stuff that we sometimes search on. Um, and so, and so machine uh, machine learning techniques for growing knowledge um, bases started um, with this with web applications. Um, when it comes to extending these methods to domain ontologies. Um, one of the uh, there's about there's a few different problems one of them is having access to text corpuses that you can learn certain relationships from like um you know oranges of fruit and th th this is quite I'm giving a very very simple example but unique corpuses that you can start learning domain relationships from and um um and, and also there's a lot of ambiguity of terms like Apple is a food, but Apple is also a technology. And so you can use machine learning to, um, uh, um, to automatically um, fit instant data into an ontology, but for there is no automated evaluation. It will still have to be manual verification. So it's probably a tool to do make a manual job easier um, but this will have to be done for a very long time before these methods can become so robust that they have a precision of you know 80 or 90 percent so that's that's all i have to say so it is possible but it is a growing field um, and human evaluation is still necessary do we have anyone else on the call who's, uh, who's been uh, experimenting with machine learning and ontology uh, and data set? Especially, I, I guess, if uh, there's one other thing, which is um, uh, the FAIR data folks have been touting um, a, uh, I can drop a, a link to a video about this. They've been touting uh, a nano publication uh, format for expressing data that's for or against some hypothesis. And so that's the other area I'm interested in. Um, say we've tagged uh, data sets with food related terms. Can we now use machine learning to go out and find uh, hypothesis and evidence supporting or denying them? Um, so I, I sort of view the ontologist's role, if not, if machine learning isn't helping ontologists actually uh, provide the lexicon for data description, then perhaps machine learning is uh, still helping us cope with the volume of data and using hypothesis um, testing engines to, um, to look at this, these nano publications that are uh, encapsulating the, the data sets out there in food related, um, food related data. Lauren, you've raised your hand. Please come up. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to um, make a comment on the machine learning. So the Plantium is, I didn't have time to cover this in our talk today, but the Plantium is actually working on a machine learning project currently where um, we're working with a, a group um, and training the computer to recognize leaf shapes. And so the idea is that um, we're going to bring in images of different plant leaves and hopefully the machine, the, the computer, will be smart enough at that point after we get a big enough training set to recognize the types of leaves and hopefully categorize them. And we're, our goal down the road for this is probably to be able to assess disease symptoms. So I think 
I'm not sure about expanding ontologies, but it's, it's definitely a way to utilize ontologies, I believe. And you've raised your hand. Hi, yeah, so I was involved in a project that used machine learning to try to expand uh, ontologies and it was a little bit of a, a frustrating experience uh, actually and I'm not sure if that was because of the, the technology or if it was because of the difficulty in finding postdocs with these sorts of technical skills. Um, you know, it's very hard to find people who can do this and who are willing to be a postdoc instead of just going to work for Google or something. So that was the, the first point of frustration. Um, the second is just getting the quality annotated training and test data. Uh, sure, that yeah. sucked up so much of our project's time. Um, so, but I am a little bit of a glutton for punishment. So I'm willing to maybe <laughs> give it another try if we if uh, we can avoid some of the pitfalls that my other project had. Lee, would you like to respond or to bring up another point? Oh, I just I was going to expand. Anne is also uh, works with us and. Um, the Monarch group, uh, as do, uh, I think, a few other people who are here. We do use machine learning. Um, my experiences with um, the human phenotype ontology and to try to uh, identify similarities between diseases and possibly identify uh, a potential um, uh, mutation linkage between um, the d disease phenotypes. Um, and and we we also bridge different phenotypes between different uh, model organisms and humans. Um, that said, to expand um, ontologies, um, I have not been doing that with my own ontology, but we have been doing um, text mining and data mining tools to try to identify terms or um, make annotations between um, my ontology, um, which is medical action ontology and um, disease ontology. Um, but yes, it takes a lot of work and a lot of knowledge, uh, both of ontologies, but then uh, just domain uh, knowledge as well. No, I have to say, anybody that taught that terms their ontology project Monarch is a very cool name. It sounds like a James Bond villain. <laughs> and you're next. Yeah, so I just as a point of clarification, the project that I was talking about was about uh, using machine learning to read text in order to expand ontologies, whereas the, the machine learning that Lee was just talking about is, is more about looking at other ontologies and other types of structured data to expand um, other ontologies. Um, so I feel like that, while it's still a lot of work and still requires some degree of checking to make sure things went right, it was is far more tractable than the, the NLP solutions that we were trying to come up with. Uh, just on to a second question that I had here for in Nutritional data on project packaging is targeted at consumers, and as such, it's occasionally oversimplified, whereas a lot of the professional vocabulary tend to be extremely specific and well-designed. And, uh, and have you seen an alignment problem in between those two? Yep. So, Lily here. Um, yes, actually, um, so we started the project um, as well with the purpose of uh, provide simple terminologies. Um, because sometimes the terminologies that I, I, are used, for example, for, um, I don't know, specialists uh, are more sometimes related to the chemical name rather than um, sometimes like, or even sometimes not related to the actual function of the, um, 
dietary component. And so we actually saw that when we were uh, matching uh, or mapping the terminologies that we have or from data uh, available data or exist existing resources to KEBI, which actually contains uh, very specific and biochemical terminologies. So sometimes even as a biologist, we don't really um, understand um, that the name of that specific uh, component. So in CDNO, what we uh, are trying to do is um, to use, yes, the semantic equivalent terms, but actually um, use synonyms that are more like simple to use um, than in the way that they are actually named in Kevi. So um, yeah, and we are actually in the, in the nutritional framework that we have, we are actually using uh, the basic uh, biomolecules, which are uh, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, vitamins. Um, so with the actual simple terms, so we actually can map, for example, just total carbohydrates, total proteins or total lipids, uh, which is what uh, is actually required in, um, in packages or, um, or yeah, like um, different, um, that are targeted more for like consumers rather than just nutritionists or for example, um, I don't know, breeders uh, that can probably know a little bit more about what they are looking for as well for secondary metabolites that can be added as well. Um, yeah, but like it's, yeah, I think the synonyms are actually really the answer. Like we are trying to actually use synonyms that are more uh, simple that make it more simple than uh, than actually the, just reusing the, the the name or the terminology that is in described in Kevi. Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think that's my answer. <laughs> Anders, you've raised your hand. Yeah, I don't know if you probably have more comments about it. All right, Anders? Yes, sorry. Uh, I'm from the food composition world. And in the food composition world, we could not use CABI because most nutrients are not chemical entities. They are they are mixtures of chemical components. Furthermore, the nutrients in foods are, or the amount of nutrients you find in foods is dependent on the method of analysis in many cases. And therefore you need to have both the nutrient name and the method it was determined with in order to have a good uh, value, if you can, uh, or a good documentation. So in, in, the, in the European and in the, in the, actually in the world uh, food, of food composition data, we use either in foods uh, tag names or in food uh, component identifiers or uh, the similar Eurofer uh, component identifiers, which we have defined in Europe for the nutrients. And the difference between InFoods and Eurofer component identifiers is that InFoods include the method of analysis in their tag names, whereas we keep the method of analysis and nutrient apart in the Eurofer thesauri. Yeah. Mm. So I think what we are trying to do is actually just reuse the simple terminology from um, Kevi, but then trying to uh, create a specific action, action that can actually help us to describe in a better way the, um, the concept that we are trying to um, to represent. So it's not only just about the nutrient, but it's also like about the whole axiom 
that is um, that we are cre that we are actually creating. Uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, we also have some uh, and like I, I think I agree with you. Like it can be as well depending on like how which method do, do you use. So that's why we uh, initially were trying to create three different classes for the CDNO. So it's so it was um, the nutritional composition, uh, dietary function, and analytical method. So um, yeah, so so I think it will be also like just used in the uh, in another class that will help um, to relate and represent that knowledge and that are actually um, that can be represented together with the function and the method um, as well. I'll note that the CDNO folks have been making some effort to map over uh, their nutrients to the in foods tags that appear to be um, uh, the appropriate link. Uh, but that was leaving aside the more analytic um, in foods tags. So there's more work to do there to um, make sure the ontology world is, is, um, is matching matching the analytic, um, the existing analytic tags that are known. Yep. Uh, the next question is for Laurel Cooper from Francesco. And uh, quickly browsing the Pantheon homepage, I see that there are ontology terms and bioentities. I suppose that bioentities are entries in the database rather than the ontology part. Is it possible to handle genes and or pathways in an ontology framework without using databases. So, can you hear me? Yes. Warren, okay, thank you. Um, so, I put an answer on the document there. Yes, the, the, the bioentities bio are the data objects that are in the database. Um, so, let's see what else. Okay, yeah. Right, yeah, so the bioentities are data objects that were annotated with an ontology term. And then the second part of the question, is it possible to handle genes and pathways in an ontology framework? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about how that would work. If you, um, I think behind most of these, these platforms, there is some sort of a database. There's lots of different kinds of databases. Um, so, and I'm not sure exactly what you mean by handle. Does that mean annotate them? Um, because of course, you know, we can, you can tag, you can tag data objects with ontology terms. Um, and I, I guess they could be in, imported. These entities could be imported into the ontology as, as, um, instances. But I don't know if that's really the best way to deal with them. And I think there was actually a, a question above this too um, from our HW. Yeah, that's me. I was trying oh, that's you. to generate <laughs> leaving Francesco take the stage. Okay, Just I'm sorry, your, your audio kind of cut out there. What was that, Rob? Okay, can, can you hear me? I mean, I'm could explain yes. maybe a little better what I was asking. Uh, let's say I'm uh, um, working in the field of metagenomics uh, and I'm always struggling to uh, understand how to represent, uh, let's say, the results, so the genes and the eventually the pathways, uh, mm -hmm. so the results of an assay, of a metagenomic assay into mm -hmm. ontology. So that was uh, the, the basis of the question, let's say, because we have an ontology developed, an ontology, but we, have, uh, we, we are far away from databases. Ah. <laughs> so I would like to, let's say, use the ontology to um, do some uh, uh, pathway and genes uh, analysis. Uh, for example, if I can store the uh, pathways or genes in a sample, in a food uh, metrics, let's say, and compared to other to understand uh, what uh, what are the microbes doing and what transformation are doing on the food. This is, uh, let's say, the uh, what's behind the question. 
I see. I see. Yeah. Um, perhaps other folks on the call have some experience in dealing with this. Um, perhaps integrating the the data objects right in the ontology as an instance, or anyone else would like to comment on that? Uh, so I can certainly rant about that topic. Uh, <laughs> that one of my concerns about the, a lot of ontologies out there is that we've created an ontology, there is no instance data, and everybody walks away vision accomplished. But there is a second problem, which is to say, here's we have a re we have a representation of a logical universe in an ontology. Now, how do we fit instance data from the field into it? Right. And that's a secondary problem that somebody needs to really document. I don't think that we're doing as good of a job generally as we should be in order to make this usable from a field perspective. It's okay to disagree with me, folks. I'm just a chair. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I appreciate your comment. Uh, can I, I'll just chime in. This is Ramona uh, Walls. Just saying that, you know, there, in answer to the question, there, there are many ways that one could represent all kinds of entities in an ontology, but I think Robert's point is there is that, is, is that without instance data, without some kind of database, whether it's a relational database or NoSQL or a graph database, if you don't bring in the actual data, um, then, then what is your ontology really doing? <laughs> um, so so it's, it's hard to imagine a, a, a very useful application that doesn't store data in some way or another. Right. And, and the way that the plantium does it is one very, very useful way of doing it. It's very similar to the way that the gene ontology does it, but there are, of course, dozens of other ways that it can be done as well. All right, let me move on to uh, a question for Cillian from Damien. Where does agro leave off in terms of post-harvest agronomy? I see storage process, for example, which could cover farm on-site for crop. We're wondering in food on which terms to send your way about post-harvest. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, Damien. Um, so yes, basically it's defining boundaries of the agronomy ontology and, and defining boundaries of the agronomy domain. Where, where do we stop? So, um, we have built agro, the agronomy ontology with the view of the researchers. So basically the experiment stopped after the harvest and then there is the processing of the, the harvest product to analyze it. But then um, in a classic farm, um, well, post harvest process depends on who who will be the consumer of the product? I guess if it's the the animals from the farm, it might be part of the agronomy ontology or maybe more uh, a livestock ontology. But then it's yeah, it's also a matter of defining when the food processing uh, starts. So uh, well, maybe. Um, Meda, you want to add uh, something to, to my answer? Sure. I mean, I think, um, hi, everybody. This is, this is Meda, and I work with um, Celine on, on this project. Um, and I am an agronomist, so I, I kind of take a look at this from the researcher point of view as well as, as a tool that will, um, you know, that, that's making use of the standards that we need to make use of. Uh, but I think Celine covered it pretty well. What I, I was just looking at the document uh, and, and seeing that you have uh, drying storage and then you have processing and primary processing and it's not clear to me what you mean. To me, when I think about uh, processing and where the agronomy ontology might end, I would see, for instance, if you're talking about a cereal like rice or wheat, um, I would, and the, the ontology with, with the, the actual uh, threshing um, 
and 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 you know talk a little bit about about the storage of 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 the of the threshed product for instance in that case i wouldn't go any further than that so i'm not quite sure so so when you're talking for instance with rice you could do much more uh, after you 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 thresh it, you you then soak it, you pound it. Uh, that doesn't. That's not something that we would prefer to be. Uh, or, or let me phrase it another way: we prefer not to be handling those kinds of of terms. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that does. Uh, like in. Um, Oh, just in the, in farm practice, uh, grains are stored on on farm. I, behind the question is uh, this whole this whole landscape of sampling of food for nutritional content uh, pre and post harvest. So I know the CDNO folks are interested in sampling post harvest. So we're just trying to come up with um, the, the terms that are are hidden away in there. And it's not just pre uh, harvest. And post harvest, there's also a storage. Absolutely, sample. yeah. yeah. So after a year, they've been sitting around. But um, I think your delineation it sounds fairly simple. Uh, so that's good. I mean, well, I like a clear boundary. Yeah, and I think I think you know uh, another example that occurs to me that may be of direct relevance to you is something like aflatoxin in maize, for instance. Um, and and the and the and the level of aflatoxin is pretty well determined, or can be associated with um, how that maize is stored. And so there, I think you know where we would end is just with with the storage um, methods, perhaps the storage you know the the storage techniques rather. Um, and then you know you, perhaps that that would be of relevance to you, so you could draw an agro for a particular term. Uh, but then the the rest of the that, that pipeline essentially would probably be your domain. That's that's how I'm seeing it. But we can certainly talk more about this, you know, and and go have a little bit more of a back and forth of of um, after this meeting. Yeah, it, it, uh, determined by particular use cases, I think. Right, uh, food on it initially it was it was just going to be about food products, describing yeah. them um, for epidemiology, mm -hmm. but now. Um, now we're going further back into the supply chain of distribution and, and manufacturing and, and so on. So, yeah. Um, okay. Good. If you're talking, Warren, you're muted. Now I see you're not muted, but we're still not hearing you. If you uh, are talking, <laughs> you're giving me the the floor, Damien. It's uh, you're yeah. And, I think oh yes, Elizabeth. Sure, go for it. I'm sorry. I saw the pop-up window saying that you're trying to open my mic. So. Okay, I rose my hand because on that part of the discussion, I think agronomy, the agronomy ontology at, at, uh, has its uh, boundaries, in they, indeed. Uh, what I wanted just to mention is the post-harvest qualities uh, is, are very important for also the, the crop improvement. So in the crop ontology, you can find some description of the, uh, you know, uh, life, uh, shape life, all that, uh, also some qualities for processing into food products. Of course, we are targeting more uh, a certain type of products related to our research uh, in tropical and subtropical area, but we have per crop a list of quality traits which encompass some of the post-harvest traits and the, the processing traits. We are also working with a new project uh, with food scientists and uh, we are now discussing two, uh, developing at least uh, two ontologies. And we are looking for at Foodon and we're looking at other ontologies as necessary. And one is to describe the value chain you just have on your, on your uh, drawing uh, and have a description of what we call the market segment. 
So the, the farmers, the local processors, industrial processors, traders, consumers. And so we would like to have a, a clear definition of those market segments and be able to link that back to, to the preferred trade per um, uh, value chain stages you have in, in the drawing uh, on, in this document. So in fact, it's a complementary work we are launching at the moment. It's very, uh, very new, so we are not very far. And we are also collecting processing techniques for those food products. So we are moving out from the crop itself and we are now just trying to find ways of describing the food products for this type of crops. Okay, that brings up one other point, which is, um, I can't remember whether it was agro or crop. I was looking at traits um, to describe a crop by, but it wasn't an experimental plot. Um, it was actually just, you know, it would be in the, in the course of a regular farm. Um, but the, the sense of experiment, agricultural experiment was sort of baked into a lot of the terms. And so I was wondering if you see um, a need to have a parallel vocabulary for a regular farming practice um, that's outside of um, the experimental context. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it's still actually just describing all the same kind of um, uh, traits. It's or, um, uh, sorry, treatments. Uh, it's just that the treatment itself wasn't done in an experimental context. Uh, so something to consider, and, and maybe I'll follow up with you. I, I, I just I didn't want to have to have a whole parallel set of, um, of terms that were kind of talking about exactly the same thing, but outside of the experimental context. Yeah, we, we are facing the same, uh, uh, yeah, the same issue with when, when we are dealing with data coming from uh, consumer surveys. It's not mm. really experimental, it's more collecting what, what the answers are. So it's outside the real experiment or uh, with any treatment. So mm. same kind of, yeah. So I think we, we could discuss this with Sudan at least. So if we start de 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 defining and describing our food products, we, we are aligned with what you have at least, or we connect what would be. Mm. Okay, and I presume CDNO uh, would be a factor too. If, if uh, well, it depends. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll take more. Uh, continue this uh, offline. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. And uh, so we are, I think, at the bottom of the question list. Robert, do you have anything else to um, to talk about? Otherwise, we should open it to the floor to anyone else who's. Um, I'm sorry, I seem to be having problems with my microphone. Mm -hmm. We hear you now. Last comment that I'd like to make uh, to this discussion is that the delineation between the farm and the processing is very important in that a lot of on-farm cleaning gets done of the, of the crop. And it's not uncommon to have 10 or 20% of your harvest be de uh, just be stone and other non-crop elements. So from the agronomy perspective, if you're trying to do yield analysis, that crop, initial crop cleaning is very important because you're losing a lot of your, what you think is your yield, but is actually non-consumables. And from going to the food product, the, that influences a lot of quality of the crop that's being put into that food processing and what additional uh, processing is going to be done to it to clean it up. Yeah, I can actually um, echo there. So Graham King of Southern Cross University uh, told me uh, what to <laughs> somebody who does not know agronomy was kind of shocking, which is that there are a number of farms where 30% uh, of the carrot crop is actually left to uh, waste or compost right on the farm because um, it's not up to grade. So what I didn't really explore in food on so far is this whole grading process, this on-farm grading, and then all of the other choices for grading all the way up to um, uh, 
industrial processing of food. And from a sustainability perspective, it sounds to me like we really need to develop or echo the existing language that's around that in, in ontology. Now, maybe that's not quite in food on, or maybe it is because, um, because uh, there isn't a, a, a curation group that's specialized in that in that particular area. And if that's the case, then food on will take on those kind of terms. So that's the other reason I'm interested in this. All right. Uh, I believe we've exhausted all of the questions that are on paper here. Anybody in with another question which has not been read now? Don't be shy. You aren't being graded on this. <laughs> Damien, did you see my response to your question? Um, we were, I know you're leading the discussion, so you had asked about the names on the, the right. uh, CO terms. Right, yes. <clears throat> yes. So that's maybe a bigger question for Elizabeth, but when we, when we at Plantium, this is Laurel speaking, at Plantium, when we import the crop ontology vocabularies into Plantium, we append the term name with the crop name. And I think that's what you were asking. I wasn't super clear. Yes. So that's yeah. exactly what I'm asking. Um, so just, just for the audience, uh, there's a little bit of an issue. I was just asking Laurel about, um, which is when you go to OLS to look up uh, plant, crop traits for particular crops, uh, but you don't know which crop, you're just looking for a trait. Um, you get back a whole bunch of traits, but you can't tell which crop ontology um, ah. is, is, um, is involved in it. So it's a guessing game and you have to click yeah. on each one to finally find the wheat. But That's, it sounds good. You need to know, you probably need to know the prefix numbers, what crop they, you know, because the so could you could could you click on the link that I put in the chat since you're sharing your screen? I did. Or I, Warren. Oh, that's Warren who's, who is uh, Warren. Yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me share it with Warren. Right. Mom. Um, I can just comment that uh, okay. the name of the prop is in in the display of the OLS, so you can select if you want mice or rice. Um. So the issue was when people are searching in OLS, uh, we're confronted with, um, this is, is more just a side tech discussion, but. Um, right, it's kind, it's of, kind of an really interesting th thing though. It's, it's interesting to hear how other people are viewing these things. Right. Yeah, uh, um, let me put this for everyone. So I put a, a link in the chat to one of the terms at Plantium and, the other thing, the other thing, if you have the, if you have the, the code, you know, the ID, that mm -hmm. encodes the crop name. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, right, yeah. Thing. So I'll, I'll share my screen so uh, people know okay. what I'm talking about. Yeah. This is probably, this is probably interesting for everyone too, so not just. Right. And, you know, that's something that we, that we thought about at Plantium too, yeah. <clears throat> so when I look at this, I think, oh, CO321, that's wheat. CO322 is maize. Right. And right. Yeah, so those, world, yeah. It does not know a thing about that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Are, are, uh, in our brains. And the it, other issue is that if you do, um, if you do a search for a grain iron content, you're only getting one back for some reason in the OLS. Um, oh system and you're not getting anything back in onto B. So um, what you just showed me, Laurel, is neat in that I'm seeing the actual name of the grain in front. And um, but I so now I'm puzzled about why that wouldn't show up here in OLS unless they're looking at a different version of this. Well <clears throat> yeah so they're at OLS they're pulling in the CO vocabularies before we've processed them for Plantium. So could you could you click on the link? Could you click on the link in the chat, and I can just show you how it looks different. Right. Yeah. Um. <laughs> or I can share if you want. Sure. 
you take the show. Sure, yeah. I'll do that. Okay. So I didn't cover all the details on this, but uh, let's see. Here we go. <clears throat> so in a comparison to that term that you just saw, the ALS, which is the same term, it's the CO321-222 um, grain iron content. When we import the, these vocabularies into Plantium, we append the term name with the crop name at the beginning and then the, I'm not sure what you would call this, the aspect maybe at the end, because the the CO vocabularies have the trait, they have the method, they have the scale, and then all that is combined into the variable. So we, when we import those, we append the names with whether it's a trait, a method, a scale, or a variable. Mm -hmm. And so if you look down here, you can see below this green iron content trait is the variable term. And the reason why the name looks a little bit weird because it's an abbreviation of the, of the um, parts that are in there. So it's grain iron. It's not a typo. <laughs> and behind this is the, the method and the scale that the breeders use to measure that. So yeah, that's definitely something to think about it, about the way it's done at OLS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, if I may. Sure, Elizabeth, thank you. Laurel, thank you. I think in the plantain, it's clear you have uh, imported the crop uh, as a prefix, which is great. In the OLS, uh, we, in fact, I know Marie Angelique is in touch with the, the OLS team. And the fact is when you search your term, you can see on the main window uh, the crop ontology. So you see it's for wheat, maize, okay. uh, and then you can click on, on the term and then you will have the display of the crop specific ontology. So I suppose the idea was to not perhaps duplicate, have a wheat grain uh, iron content because, yeah. So normally- Yeah, so here's all the different ones. Yeah. Wheat, barley, and then you can select from this list and not from the pick list. But if you feel it's a, it's something, it's a problem, then perhaps we can work with the OLS to, to provide the, the, pre, the, the crop as a prefix to the threat uh, itself. To the, but, so if you click on grain iron content, you will this see. This one? Yeah. The and it does, yeah, it does show. With mm -hmm. So if you duplicate by adding wheat as a prefix, you have to duplicate it at the... Yeah. Yeah. We can right. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. So it's just different. I'll just add, I, go I ahead. Add, like similar problems are cropping up in other ontologies. Whenever you're getting a whole bunch of ontologies using the same term, patient oh, yes. was notorious uh, in Oval Foundry. There's at least 13 versions of patient. So <laughs> what I'm advocating or is that if a label actually has some kind of material difference from some other label or uh, that it actually include um, indication of that in the label itself of the term. Yeah. Anyway, that's a side, side thing. Uh, we should, we should just, uh, just. Uh, you know, the, you know, the best example of that problem with the names is um, the NCBI taxonomy they're, they have a term root, and that really yes. confuses our browser <laughs> because uh, I think now I think they That's I think they've fixed the problem. name. I think it's called like NCBI root now, but for a long time, you know, in Protege, you'd look for root, and I would get the NCBI term, and I'm like, this is strange. What's going on here? <laughs> but definitely something to something to think about. And I also wanted to say that I'm really excited about this, this um, trend with using ontologies to describe food. And we'd love to integrate some of your food ontology into Plantium since we're, you know, linking with you. And mm -hmm. yeah, maybe in the next few years or something if right. we get funded again. <laughs> yeah. It's really nice. To that I like this brings up a one other subject which has been kicked around uh, which is uh, a key subject that 
not really involved in yet, but um, we're looking to the plant biology folks for solutions, which is subspecies level um, varietals uh, of plants, of which there are like hundreds and hundreds of wine and grape and right. apple, uh, grape and apple varieties. And, uh, the nomenclature around that, uh, which hasn't made it into ontology, really. Um, so, for example, we've just got a handful of different apple varieties that, um, whereas I, I'm intimidated by the fact that Wikipedia lists about 900 apple <laughs> varieties. Yeah. So, yeah. so we want to be able to just try working on, on wheat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, same thing. So uh, there, been, there, there could be a whole workshop on the topic of um, subspecies nomenclature. nomenclature. Yeah. yeah. Jessica very... and I have been putting out a uh, ontology on wheat varietals specifically. The major ontological problem is that it's based on primarily registration and breeders' rights within certain jurisdictions. So building okay. a picture that is portable from one place to another is requiring a little bit more ontological complexity that I would rather have. Hmm. Interesting. And so the, uh, so, right now we do have a text mining project that is bootstrapping to try and create a lot more definitions for, uh, well, nobody really knows what AAC Eurostar actually means unless you're in specifically that business. Right. And even though the farmer may be using that, by the time it gets to the, the processor, all they know is that it's Durham wheat. And there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity there for translation and for identification. Yeah, that's definitely something that's um uh, we've run across at Green Genes as well is um a lot of the germplasm names and the species names are changing and they're used differently in different places. And it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, can I, can I say something there that, you know, for plant genetic resources, this is an issue. And I think it's been partially addressed um, in the uh, association of DOIs with um, individual accessions within plant genetic resource collections. So, there will be distributions of uh, different cultivars which are stored there, but that's a separate world from uh, commerce and production of um, wheat where people are growing different varieties. But from a genetics point of view, even those individual cultivars and accessions within a gene bank um, drift as they're regenerated. So the, ultimately the only identifier is the DNA sequence. Um, and it's something within the genetic resource community and within DivSeq we're discussing at the moment is how do we start approaching this uh, to have some formalization that could be used not only in genetic resources, but through the pipeline where people are using uh, different cultivars. Because uh, most of the research data in the world are at this very specific uh, level of what we call a genotype. Um, I have to agree with you. The, there's a big gap in between what happens operationally on farms and what researchers are doing. And at the end of the day, what happens is somebody says, you know, this bin contains X and we yep. take that for granted. And that gets completely separated from what it actually is. And it makes it very difficult to transport that real world data into a, the experimental and statistical realm. So at some point we need to find a way to crosswalk the data while accounting to the fact that when you have 1500 bushels of wheat there's going to be one kernel that's not what you think it is. Sure. Uh, it, it is, it's not only just for experimental data, it's about trade as well. Someone's claiming that they're selling you a variety of, I know, let's say, um, a red delicious apple. Um, and it isn't, uh, then there's a problem when you're selling it. And when people are grading um, horticultural crops, especially, the cultivar can be quite important in terms of what's the value proposition for buying that particular uh, cultivar. So being able to have a, a method of verifying and tracing 
for traceability um, and some uh, structured vocabulary for um, and labels uh, identifiers, unique identifiers, I think is something which would um, you know, transition between the world of food and consumption and production and research and breeding. Um, so if someone could, uh, or groups of people could start to tackle that problem, I think there'd be uh, a huge benefits. So Graham, I don't want to steal Jessica's thunder. She will be talking about that in a few weeks, but mm -hmm. I agree. And there's monstrosities like harmonized systems, which everybody uses for trade, but don't actually tell you what it is, which make that problem <laughs> even more complicated. All right, so we have about five minutes before the, our uh, session ends. Would anybody like to bring up another topic before we close? Um, just a note to Tarini, if you're on the call, maybe you just want to give po people a heads up about this experience, um, this taste um, experience that we have in store in the workshop. Um, sure. Oh, uh, but I think next week I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I could say something now. So the idea was to, um, we're talking so much about food, um, and the idea was to taste food as well in the conference. And um, obviously, this is a much better experience when it's happening at a physical location. But since it's not, um, we thought to um, make it possible anyway. And so the idea is um, you will be provided with a set of instructions to obtain your samples. And, um, and what, what, the, what the objective of this is to compare samples that have been made from different ingredients and they have different nutrition profiles and to associate your hedonistic response, which is whether you like it or not, or um, your sensory response, what the texture is, what the taste is, what the smell is. So to associate your sensory response to the nutrition content. And um, when we present the results, it'd be very interesting to see um, whether there was any correlation do people tend to like things that um, taste a certain way and nutritionally um, are also more healthy, um, which the exercise will explain what this means. Okay. Um, also what's very interesting because this is now, sorry, which is now online is to not make it seem like this was a compromise that we have to do this online anyway, um, but the, the, the procedure by which you procure your samples um, it'd be very interesting to see if that influences your sensory outcome in any way. So I guess That's my it. question is um, that the, uh, the whole uh, experience does involve us cooking stuff, right? Yes, I didn't explain the process of obtaining your samples, but oh, there, okay, okay. There is so all, all, <laughs> all I want to know is, do we need a bit more heads up about the ingredients we should go shop for and, and to uh, before? Or will there be plenty of time to, to get the ingredients um, lined up? I, for it? I don't think ingredients will be that difficult to obtain. Um, and there's a number of substitutes. So, uh, but there will be a recipe, there'll be a video showing you how to make it uh, because it's, you might want to know what the consistency is or how you should chop something. Um, but I don't think the ingredients will be that hard. Um, uh, the presentation is next week um, at the same time. And before that, well before that, um, by the weekend, um, all the participants should have uh, detailed instructions. Okay, great. So just to say, folks, um, we're really looking forward to tapping into your mind and your taste buds in this workshop uh, like no other uh, ICBO workshop can. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Thank you for the advert, <laughs> Damien. <laughs> All so right. there's going to be an email about that then for next week. Yes, yes. Yes. I will send an email with all instructions um, by the weekend and the presentations next week. And then you have a week 
to do the exercise um, and then I'll analyze the results and present it at the end of the conference. Oh. All right, folks, this is all the time that we have. Thank you for your time and thank you to the presenters for outstanding work. I look forward to the next session next week. Great. Well, thank you, Robert, for hosting. Yeah, thanks for, <clears throat> thanks for hosting and thanks to the audience as well. And thanks to the other presenters. Mm -hmm.